Our next speaker is Mr. William Rutherford. He is an attorney at law in Peoria, Illinois. On Mr. Scott's lecture, he was saying that one man can make a difference, and I think a good example of this is Mr. Rutherford. He follows the criteria that a good lesson is a good example, and so he strives to be an example by doing things instead of just talking about it. It was by actually doing something that he was able to preserve the Goose Lake Prairie. It was by being committed and following this commitment that he made the decision to resign from a cabinet post with the government uh, that was, he was the director of Department of Conservation, but because he felt the political aspects of this were conflicting with conservation, he followed the commitment of resigning this post. I think that this type of an example is the type of thing that we all need to be, and right now I'd like to introduce to you Mr. William Rutherford. Thank you, Karen, fellow conservationists. At the risk of seeming just a little bit unappreciative of our wonderful host, but as a practical example of an adaptation to an environmental problem, so we don't start this wonderful conference with a saddle sore, how about standing up for about 30 seconds? Okay, thank you, and I will put you back to work. <clears throat> Doug just gave us an excellent presentation of some very valid philosophical points. Now let's get down to some of the things that can make, if I may contradict you one point, some fun out of accomplishment. Because this job and mission must not be deadly and dull, even though it's dreadfully important. Let's find the portions of one-upsmanship, of how we can use our resourcefulness, our imagination, to do like Mr. Yannickone said, and he said, sue the bastards. Let's find out how to lick them without lawsuits, how to get the job done, get them on our team, and make things happen effectively. We haven't much time. It's going to take some dedication, a great deal of hard work, but what I suggest that you and I can accomplish is much more fun than a golf score or a bank balance. Survival, of course, but let's have the sense of humor, the effectiveness to be salesmen, evangelists, people with a purpose that recognize there are no alternatives. We've got to get it done. Let's find out how to do it effectively. I attended a very profound conference when I was still in the governor's cabinet in Illinois with some very talented people in science, some great teachers and leaders. But in the question and answer period, a youngster stood up and said he thought he could summarize in a few words most of what had been said during this rather lengthy session. He wanted to tell the story, he said, of the little boy who had just climbed, put on his pajamas and climbed into bed. The hand of the clock was about here, and the old family clock started to strike. One, two, three, four, up to eight as it was supposed to, but it kept on going. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Finally stopped on sixteen. And the little boy was so startled and surprised, he jumped out of bed and ran downstairs to the living room and said, Mommy, Daddy, come quick, come quick. It's later than it's ever been before. <laughs> and he summarized a great deal of profound thought. That's what we're after. It is late. So let's recognize it. And what are we going to do about it? Now, I was asked to speak to you about Goose Lake Prairie, but I'll tell you about this wonderful piece of unspoiled territory in Illinois only because it illustrates a thread of thought. Hopefully, you will someday enjoy our beautiful Goose Lake Prairie, but more importantly, I hope you'll enjoy a philosophical approach to action, the fun of accomplishment that will be more meaningful to you. And at the risk of personalizing things, may I go back a little bit? Because if I were to teach you to fly my airplane, you would expect me to take you through a few takeoffs and landings to illustrate how I do it and why I do it. Because I want to give you some shortcuts. Some of the one-ups and ships, some of the visions that were given to me by far wiser heads than mine who shared their dreams and their accomplishment that I could have easier steps, and this is my purpose with you. 
you and I can accomplish an awful lot more. The power of good, the power of positive action to a determined person who is informed, fair, and who can look people in the eye and whose background will stand the test after you have acted that what you spoke of you believed, right or wrong, without selfishness and for something worthwhile. Because when people can find out that you do speak truth, that you do have a conscience, that you are not ashamed of the practicality of idealism, and you will not embarrass them, deceive them, or misuse them, you can accomplish a great deal. Because that good example, and I profess not to have a halo, don't misunderstand me, but the good example is certainly the only lesson that amounts to very much. I'm very, very sure from many experiences I've had in recent years, the public is dreadfully hungry for something they can trust and believe in. And so you will find that worthwhile endeavor, if it's done with a little bit of imagination and preparation, can give you multiple benefits for each moment and each dollar that are expended, each one of which is completely worth the time and money, the effort. And this is part of the fun of the game of getting much more for your money's worth and the time that life permits us. Because not only must we solve these environmental problems with compassion and fair play, realism and immediacy, but we also have a wonderful form of government that unless we understand and put back into the ideals those people in Philadelphia had, instead of just the facade of convenient words to cover up selfish purpose, if we lose this form of government, we shall lose the tools of citizen act activity that no people in the history of man have ever enjoyed as you and I can if we have the sense of purpose to use it, to recognize it, and to cherish it. Because neither one shall survive without the other, I submit to you. Back in 1964, I'll give you a little background because it's the only way I can explain to you why I believe this so much and why I tested it and tasted it and tried it. Four or five of us in my home community in Peoria had been quite concerned about the absence of expansion in our park system. We had some lovely parks in 1900, and like so many communities, the automobile came in and distracted people's attention. They didn't take the picnic hamper on the streetcar of the family on Sunday, they drove instead. And America found that strange change, the gradual difference in interest in the community from parks and greenery that's been so magnificent in Europe and other parts of the world, which were fine here at the time of your grandfather's but which has since been forgotten. Our park district had had a master plan for 30,000 acres by 1980 to meet the reasonable needs of the community. They had 2,000 acres. They hadn't bought an acre except for a couple of golf courses since 1900. And those of us who had worked in the rehabilitation of the handicapped, worked on public aid problems. I was the first man fired in the Public Aid Commission, a volunteer job where we spent a million dollars a day on aid for dependent children. And I was fired. I've lost a good many jobs. I haven't regretted one of them because I stood up and fought for birth control for public aid recipients. It wasn't polite. Nice people didn't talk about it then, but in a very few years it had become rather common. It was worth the effort to get fired, get the headlines, be invited to talk, stir up a little thing, twist a few tails, make a few things happen. So in this work we found that the greatest need in our community we felt was not building schools or bridges or hospitals even, because they can be built, but the land that's disappearing so fast will take another ice age to replace. And that's even longer than I plan to be around. Common folks like you and me take a crack at it and see what can be done. We did. We moved without any new federal legislation, any new state legislation with all the handicaps and all the frustrations, just a couple of bullheaded, determined old men, from 2,000 acres to now we have over 22,000 acres added to it. I found it was much easier to get money and help than I would have dreamed. The first year we dug our heels in, started talking, wholly unembarrassed about being bores and repetitive, if you like, not the least bit chagrined to be called an old lady with tennis shoes, at least bit embarrassed about the posies and the birds. Pretty hard-bitten old lawyers who have seen some pretty grim parts of life 
And believe me, as a commissioner of the Public Aid Commission, working with caseworkers and seeing people who have no souls in their lives, no, nothing to inspire them, no purpose, no pleasures that we consider valid, no wholesome family outdoor recreation, no chance to give a kid a crack at life, and the things that really count. I tell you, the practicality of idealism is abundantly evident in efforts such as this. First year, if you'd told me in 1964 we would have had 14 gifts worth half a million dollars in our community, I'd have said, you're kidding. It's true. We could keep on going, the tempo increases. And that little pattern in Peoria has been copied by Bloomington, Galva, Rockford, many others around there. Because of the few things that a, an old man will suggest to you, if I may, as almost fundamentals of life, the accomplishments that are worthwhile shall not cover, not come from Washington or Springfield in the case of Illinois. There should come places that you and I live where people act and work and are concerned, can exercise stewardship, an area that's small enough to understand and work with and still get home for a night's sleep, where you have the care and the understanding. You don't care about what happens in Kickapoo Creek and Peoria. You don't even know where it is. You have things around here I can't understand because I can't visualize them. I didn't play there as a child. I'm not concerned because I don't know it. We have to have the understanding and the participation for it to have real meaning. But if each one of us can do a job in his own community with the talents and the interest and the particular thing they like to work on, repeat it often enough, you change the fabric and the framework and the livability that benefits all the way around. I have seen this happen in my community. I saw it happen back in the late 1940s and early 50s when a similar group of people were determined to do something about the problems of rehabilitation of the handicapped and give to a community the benefits the Air Force had for young men all shot up and torn apart. I could give you quite a, quite a testimony of the problems and the benefits to you as a taxpayer if you don't care about the moral values of a man that's on his back helplessly as an invalid, if you don't care about his family's concerns and the quality of his life, just in your own tax buck that you lose if I'm not caring and give you a case that'll justify all the effort you like to. And I saw this little community do some things that practical people said couldn't happen. And I've also seen the Mayo Foundation for the last 15 years send people to Peoria to see how a community can have rehabilitation of the handicapped. The first place in America test out ideas. The man that came to run it for us came because he was, said he was so happy to have a place where there was action. He was so damn tired of chicken a la king and green peas at luncheon meetings. They talked and did nothing. He'd go any place to do a job and work at it. And this is the same philosophy we're trying to get across to you and your friends here tonight. How do we do it? A lot simpler than it looks. Because we had this good luck, if you want to call it such, of increasing our parklands, Governor Kerner made the statement of each county in Illinois had done the same thing on its own it would have saved the state taxpayers $150 million as of 1966, and it's grown a great deal since then. I guess it was that reason that, uh, and the bitter criticism and the uh, persistent harassment I benefited the Department of Conservation of the State of Illinois with, that I was asked to do the job myself. I wanted to try it. We hope we could duplicate. Even with our very stringent financial problems in Illinois, we have a capability of always being in tough financial shape. But uh, see what we could do with it. And uh, following the same philosophy, although I had no monies released to me, in that very, very long year I was the director of the department before I was promoted to a super cabinet position from which I resigned in contempt because of the double use of words. In that very long year I found by talking to groups such as you and working with you and trying ideas and pointing things that I found at work simply and understandably, we got more land as gifts for the state of Illinois in the first eight months I was in office than they'd bought and acquired by all the methods in the previous 10 years put together. And it's fun. It is fun. It's a good game. Now I'll give you the story of Goose Lake Prairie just as a sample. Because in the gubernatorial campaign, both parties had seized upon a question to please the public about a place called Goose Lake Prairie. This was a strange fluke by which a piece of ground in one family had existed unplowed and unspoiled by artificial fertilizer, herbicides, and all the rest. The family had acquired it in the early 1830s, and they retained it. It was a piece of ground found by Dr. Beecher, the president of the Chicago Academy of Science, only 60 miles from Chicago in Grundy County, just below the Illinois River. Strangely enough, within about a mile of the Dresden Atomic Energy 
or atomic uh, power plant of Commonwealth Edison, another one of my favorite companies. And uh, but I'll tell you how I use them too. And uh, this ground hadn't been plowed, it had a few boulders, the glacier left a few things, it made it a little tougher to plow and the family liked it. It was the only place I have ever seen from a helicopter in Illinois in my lifetime, two wild coyotes. Deer, it's a really a strange, wonderful thing. When you get down low in a helicopter, you get the same feeling you do in, in East Africa. The beautiful feeling, if you can block out a few power lines and a few factories and let your imagination help you a little bit, the grass and the beautiful motion of the vegetation and the flowers and occasional animal you'll see, the ponds, does indeed re resemble much of the little bit of unspoiled East Africa. But both governor, candidates for governor had promised to do something about it. My predecessor in office, the day we exchanged uh, jobs, or at least I took his job, it explained that it's a bucket of worms, don't get caught in it, Bill. We've, we've got no money except about a, a very modest sum left in the Illinois Building Authority, and you shouldn't spend it all on one piece of ground there. You better spread around. It's too hot politically. Let the legislature worry about it. And um, I didn't go down to Springfield to have excuses, look the kids in the eye and say why we didn't do it. That's why I had been frustrated with all my life. I went down to see how we could get it done. And I knew the story that the land had been worth about $800 a year or two before. And that when some people pecked at it a little bit to see what they sell it for, the industrial people found it was a, an elegant place for factory sites. Matter of fact, since that time, less than 24 months ago, there have been over 30,000 acres of industrial land purchased north of the river and 7,000 acres immediately to the east of it. So it is a hot area to make the Ruhr Valley of America. And it made tough competition. The subsidiary of U.S. Steel Company, the EG&E Railroad, has a bridge across the Illinois, and they aren't cheap to build. And only had one customer on that railroad, that spur, and it had its eyes upon this. It had the county board of supervisors sold on the idea it'd be better to have uh, industry there and pick up the uh, tax rates so the local folks wouldn't have to pay for their school children's education. And let industry do it for them. You know, that's a classic reason to do things industrially, by which others than industrialists are f part of the prostitution. And. Uh, we found a very hostile board of supervisors, and they also didn't want some of the folks from the south side of Chicago out in their lovely neighborhood, and they didn't like campers, they didn't like traffic, and a lot of other things, so that I had about 18 strikes against me when I started on it, beside no money. And uh, also, the first thing I heard was the Green Refractories Company had threatened me with a lawsuit. So <laughs> that's just like putting Burr Rabbit in the briar patch. They didn't scare me. I've been through lawsuits for 35 years. So um, they threatened me the lawsuit if we aren't cut off some of the things they wanted to do. How do you go about it? No money, a tremendous need. Indu industry in the position just outbid you all the way along the line. The tremendous cumbersomeness of governmental action where you must do it all before the press whether you like it or not. So they can read in the newspapers what you're going to do and then you can read in the newspaper what they've done. So uh, how would you go about it if you're in this spot? And uh, the reporters were calling you at home they have a nice way, too, and the Chicago papers go to press at different hours, and they call you up at 2 and 3 in the morning. You know, if your boys had an accident or your death in the family or what, and you wake up, ask you about Goose Lake Prairie. <laughs> so um, I did the practical thing. I simply called the family that owned the property. They were quite angry because they'd read in the papers about what was going to happen on the ground, but nobody had talked to them either. And I said, uh, could I come see you on Saturday, if you please? I think we've got an important thing. I'd like to at least meet you. They were a little chilly when I arrived. I don't blame them. I told them so. I hadn't been at fault. I was terribly sorry they'd been embarrassed because it wasn't the way government should be to people. So two things. First of all, thank you very much for preserving for posterity a magnificent, irreplaceable heritage. Secondly, can't we find a way we can work together to preserve it and make it a, li a little easier for you that you can enjoy these blessings and also after we've forgotten someone else can still have them? Well. They were very fine people. We got the thing quieted down a little bit, talked to lawyers who were straight up square fellows. We got them down from $1,500 to $1,400 an acre, and they knew the price of $1,500 or more was fair, and they knew that I knew it was too because I'd done some careful checking before I arrived, you can bet you. I talked to the trial lawyers. I knew in the neighborhood what it'd be like before a jury in Grundy County for the state to condemn. I knew we'd pay a lot more than that. It's easier to level with people. Here we are. I got a shiny tin cup. How can you help me? They agreed they'd talk to me the next week, so I went back to my office. I wasn't going to talk to anybody about the paperwork. I know how these stories can leak, so I prepared the contracts myself. Now, the Illinois Building Authority is not the same as the Department of Conservation. I know that. I know some of the things that take 
active advisory committees and the governor and all the rest, but I knew the land had to be bought. So I prepared a contract and I signed for the Illinois Building Authority with about as much authority as you have. <laughs> Wor <coughs> Worst they could do was sue me. I took a check for down payment. I've got a document that these people signed that they would at least we make sure they had to sell. It was my problem if I couldn't deliver the money. I could, we had the appraisals, the building authority would go not over $1,000 an acre, I had, so I had to raise $600,000 within 90 days. And there are times I wakened up at night and wondered how I had so much uh, brashness, but at the time it seemed the thing to do. And so I signed a committee myself, it was then $700,000 personally if I couldn't find the money to get the job done. When the, when the industry learned about it, oh boy. Uh, there were really some fireworks. They, the legislature that had been so close to them and assured them nothing could possibly happen because tradition said that it couldn't possibly happen, came storming to my office. Oh boy, he was mad. He was after my hide. And I said, I'm just sorry as the Dickens, but it's done. If you won't paint yourself in a corner and make yourself too well committed to something that's now happened, I think you'll be a hero in a few months if you can just trust me and bide your time. He didn't like the idea, but he didn't have any choice. So um, I did go out with my tin cup, and I, this is one of the things I learned. It's easier to raise ten thousand dollars than it is ten dollars. First time I ever met one man. Of course, I had done a little little homework too to sort out who might be receptive and who had the capabilities. And he'd been pretty well picked over over the years. You can bet you to have that much money. <laughs> and I appeared with, before him with a plan. And I told him what I was doing and how and why and what the holes were, in it, and I knew them. And he kind of grinned and said, "I never met a lawyer like you before. What you got in mind?" I left his office with $300,000. Only one condition he put on it, that I not disclose his name because he had too many relatives he didn't want to have to talk to about it. <laughs> Pretty easy condition, isn't it? And I raised the $700,000 as part-time, and I had a lot of fun in the process, a satisfaction that I could look my youngsters in the eye and say, this was worth doing. But let's back to some of the lawsuits. Here was the eg and &E Railroad. They were really upset because it was a very big problem to them, and they had a committee go to the governor's office. And I had a number of visits in the governor's office. I was always called before the principal because I'd done something before they could squawk an accomplished fact and it caused some embarrassment and displeased a number of folks. But it was done, and uh, the governor was always very nice to me personally. But I knew he was quite uncomfortable more than once. And this time I met with a very prestigious group that had 15 minutes of the governor's time, and so. I took the 15 minutes talking too much, and they were very angry. They didn't get a chance to get a word in. That's just what I had in mind. <laughs> and then I called the president, the EG&E Railroad, I wrote him a letter, rather. He'd had his vice presidents and representatives and everybody else there. There was fire in there, and they were really going to let me have it. And I simply said to him in a practical thing, I think we've had enough committees and small boys working on this. Why don't I buy you a hamburger at the Morris Airport and let me show you what the problem is? And so the president came out from Pittsburgh, and we ate in the Morris Airport, now that's something too for a president of a railroad because it's a converted chicken house, one of these little oval things like this. <laughs> it was a pretty good hamburger, and he paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> and we went over this ground in my department helicopter. We sat there in the grass. He said, I think I understand what you mean. He said, could we compromise and split it? And I said, I'd like to very much. It'd be easier for me, obviously, and for you too. And this has been suggested. Well, industry have half and me have half, but it's just like my lovely pet dog. If I cut her in two, neither half's worth very much to anybody. <laughs> this is not enough of a heritage, mere 2,000 acres. I've seen 30,000 acres for parks on the west side of Berlin, the Grunwald, and they desperately need land much more than you and I. And yet it's too important to them to chop up for construction or anything else. They recognize this. I've worked in the care of the handicapped and in geriatrics. I was taught by my Danish friends that the environment is part of the treatment of the patient, to have a fit, decent place to look at. I've had people compromise me out in parking lots and practical buildings where you should have kept more green and flowers and a bit of quiet that soothes the soul and helps cures the patient. No thanks, not again. But to make a long story short, these are the people that are so antagonistic. Fight them? No. Sit and reason? Yes. Compromise your principles, I should say not, but give them a way to get in the act. And you know, last January, when President Nixon came to Chicago at the Field Museum to meet with five governors, 
for the first time the Environmental Council has ever met outside of Washington, D.C. He brought his wife, and she had to have something to do to really show her something fine in Illinois. And if you'll read the newspapers, I cherish even the San Francisco Chronicle story on the front page, where Mrs. Nixon, who was the guest of the EG&E Railroad in the car they brought from Pittsburgh at my request, said, the greatest natural monument in Illinois is Goose Lake Prairie. And my opponent was the host beaming like this. That's fun. That is a good game. <laughs> that beats a lawsuit. And then the railroad that wanted, the company rather, wanted to get the, the very heart of the prairie, where the clay was deep. It makes fine refractory materials for the steel mills. They're the ones that were going to sue me. But they, I know how long they take to get the complaint filed. I thought they'd rather them sue me after it was done. Then it could drag as long as it wants to, then mess me up in the process of getting it done so I couldn't meet my options. I got that accomplished because I knew how he'd act. Uh, the tortoise has a fairly routine gait, as you know. And uh, that's the reason I'm trying to get you to be a little quicker. Don't think them. Don't move them. And so, how do you suppose we handle these two industries? One of them, Reichold Chemical, had threatened not to build a $120 million improvement in Illinois if they had Goose Lake Prairie as a neighbor. Somebody had sold them, they'd present them problems. I couldn't leave anything better than a wildlife preserve, a place for research and education, not even a ball game going on. But they were committed to a point, you see. So again, this wonderful Mr. Oaks, Fred Oaks, president of EG&E Railroad, and he is a real gentleman. And I'll tell you this too, young folks. The bigger the man is, the easier he is to talk to. The less fluff, the less monkey business. You're going to level with him. It didn't take me long to get across the point and get an answer, and he lived up to it, every bit of it, spirit and word both. So my opponent, if you please, was the host at a nice dinner in Pittsburgh, and I was on my way back from a conference in Washington, one of those needless, meaningless things they have there so often. And I stopped by between airplanes, and he had a dinner. And he introduced me to the president of this one company. He'd already warmed them up with a little nice uh, golf or hunting. I forgot what it was, and a few drinks. It was a very pleasant arrangement. And I arrived, and this man in his old clothes was sitting there on the porch of this nice little old hunting club. And I said, you know, if I were privileged to be the attorney for your company, and you don't mind my suggesting, these are things I think I would suggest to you I think you'd like. And from this old watch, it was six minutes from the, day I, from the moment I first met the man before we had agreement. And I pointed out to him, it was a bunch of nonsense, this fright they'd given his company. The 60 acres he owned that was in the area I wanted very much had been farmed, except for three acres of it. It wasn't the virgin prairie, so I wasn't concerned about buying a cornfield. But if he would give the land to the state, he could keep the mineral rights and take the clay he wanted, if he didn't spoil the virgin four acres that fit the other 2,000 I was saving. And if he gave it, he'd get a fine tax deduction. Secondly, he'd get all the materials he wanted. Thirdly, when he was done, we'd have a nice deep lake and I'm not thinking about something that's done the next six months. I'm thinking about the people who live here 20 years from now. Pray God there's a chance to. And then I have deep waters so the geese and the ducks and have a little better place to land, some fishing and a few other things. He could have his cake and eat it, and so could we. And we'd save the taxpayers over $100,000. And he said, made sense. We'll do it. And Reich Old Chemical, sitting in the back seat of the car while Mr. Oakey was driving back to town to get me to the airport, tried him. It was just as easy. I explained to him how this wasn't going to be a problem to him. But they had to have something to save face. They will do. We'll guarantee how it's going to be used. I'd already signed it up in the Nature Preserves Commission, so we couldn't have it trespassed or used for a park. I didn't buy precious virgin ground to have it tramped over. I bought extra ground for the camping, the parking lots, the toilets, the interpretive center, and that kind of stuff. Why I do like we so often do, buy a forest and cut it down to put a building in it. But I'd already done it, but he was so pleased with the idea that we could agree to do it. I'd already done it anyhow. I didn't have to lose much face to put it give him a piece of the paper with a, new, with a new date on it, and he's all happy. They're going to build a factory, and we still got our park. Now, these are examples of the fun you can have of just looking ahead. If you believe in something, you can look down and say, what should it be like 20 years from now, 10 years from now? And you young people don't realize what a short period of time 20 years is. I can look back 20 and 30 and lots more years than I want to talk about. I can do it with a great deal of regret because I can see the things that if they cared a little more then, had a little more realism and vision and concern of stewardship, we wouldn't have the crisis and the problems I submit to you that we have right now. And therefore, how can we be any better unless we too will project the reasonableness and the fun of doing something better than us that will last longer than our names will and put it to work? 
I read a, the Royal Bank of Canada newsletter, and if you don't receive that beautiful free publication, I'd submit that it's worth getting. And some months ago, the Royal Bank of Canada newsletter, which is written by bankers to their banking customers, a businessman's journal to business people, had an article on the environment. And the English is superb. It's a beautifully written thing, four pages, two columns, fine print, well done. It really is. And it's a, it, it was saying to its customers, the bank was, this environmental thing is not academic. This is real. This is a matter of survival, survival of the species, of life, yours and mine. Reemphasizing not someone else's problem some other time, be an expensive one now and immediate for you. There's something far more important than even the obvious things of markets and products that will be acceptable and useful and new, far more practical than just the things that will no longer be tolerated or acceptable, be subject to regulation and taxes. No, far more than that. The last sentence of this article was very heartwarming to me when they summed up and said, if you and I are to be worthy of living in this magnificent North American continent, with more blessings, material wealth, conveniences, and freedoms than any people in the history of man have even dreamed of. If you and I are to be worthy of that, you and I must recognize the existence of a compact, even though unwritten, between the dead, the living, and the unborn, that we must leave the unborn something beside debts and depleted natural resources. Now this, I submit, is not the word of an antagonist. This is a fellow citizen with a concern. And let's not divide and destroy confidences and the chance to get people working together with bullheaded damn fool statements that aren't thought out because you and I are the polluters along with this population problem you speak of and all the rest. We want the jobs in our communities. We have friends in labor unions who demand they have this kind of a job and don't want to give up employment in the community that want to have industry keep paying taxes in our community to save us the school taxes and all the rest. We're not pointing the finger. And that gets me to last, my last point, if I may. Because I believe that we do have the very finest system of government that has ever existed. Or as one wag put it, it's the, be it's, the, it's the poorest system of government except for all the others. And with its faults, those faults are far easier to correct than to start over. Let's don't burn down the barn to kill the mouse or throw out the baby of the bathwater. Let's use the common sense, the sense of humor, the sense of compassion. Let's know a little of history. I was in Siberia last August because I wanted to see as much as I could of their environmental concern. And these young people have been given this bunk about those folks that are less materialistic than we are. Just take the trip and see for yourself. I have flown for 35 years. I used to be a pilot for United Airlines, and I taught flying for the Navy. I have never flown in worse air pollution than Irkutsk, Lake Bacall area, mid-Siberia, eastern Siberia, Habarsk, places like this, Brotsk. You have to look straight down because there's so much coal smoke from Manchuria and the Russian factories that you can't see at this angle on a clear, cloudless day. You look down and see the water, the reflection of sunlight in the water. I saw five foot in diameter sewers with raw sewage. I saw industrial waste that is worse than the bad I have seen here. And I'm not, believe me, I'm not an apologist or a defender of the things I don't like of industry or communities or individuals here. I'm not known for flattery. I would have been fired quite so often if I had have been. I didn't give up a $15,000 a year raise being promoted from the cabinet level to this super cabinet position because I took it lightly either, although I had my job for a dollar a year. I did it because I believe very, very much in these things that we're talking about and addressing ourselves today and the Russian way of life, the Russian destruction, and the hell you see on the faces of people to whom you give a smile in the morning, an early morning walk, as they give you a startled glance and walk faster. Wander down at night and watch them load the Trans-Siberian Railroad at Irkutsk. Can you think you're in a 1914 movie? And look at the expressions. Vast numbers of people not speaking. As a Boy Scout going through to Budapest through Munich in 1933, I saw the faces of frightened people. 
the same thing. It's a very melancholy experience. They don't have the tools to lick the problem. The only people in the world that have the technology, which is necessary, let's face it, but the sense of purpose and the freedom and the opportunities are you and me in this great United States of America. Let's don't sell this short. Now let me tell you about a few of the problems just for a couple minutes because I think the pollutional problems, the tangible, visible evidence of foul, stinking water and air, debris, litter, noise, these things, I believe, are evidences understandable by anyone of our lack of stewardship. The double standards, the hypocrisy by which we say one thing and do another. I've talked to many, many student groups, many people much less informed than this group by far. There's a common thread of concern of wanting something, as I said before, that can be trusted and believed in. That's for real. But how can we expect people to believe the ideals and the religious values and the qualities of fair play we profess and that are really written into our laws unless we apply them as intended in the spirit? And I think as we solve the pollution matters, we shall have more trust between peoples as well as preserving a way of life that greater things can also be done. But, so you know what I'm talking about. There's a thing called patronage politics, and I won't speak for the state of Iowa because you're about 25 years ahead of Illinois. You have much more professionalism in your governmental concern about your environment. You also haven't got the hideous problems of the south side of Chicago and Madison County and East St. Louis, the overpopulation problems. You haven't got the industrial degradation for many years that have made my once lovely Illinois River that flows through Peoria, the downstream sewer of Chicago. A lot of things you don't have to endure and learn, I hope, before you take the effective action needed. But patronage politics, of which both parties of Illinois have been terribly guilty and on the national level too, is a form of prostitution and misuse of the ideal. It's a way of paying my debts to get reelected with your dollars in a variety of imaginative and sinister forms. And you can't have government that's partly honest and partly not any more than a female can be a part-time prostitute. She is or she isn't. And government either is decent or not. And I don't care how pious or nice it is at one level, unless the thing is right all the way through in decency, then we need a house cleaning. And I, I have to confess to you, however, this is not the most popular subject of conversation in Springfield. But it's becoming a lot more so, and the man that just announced his candidacy, free of both parties, a very prominent Democrat who wrote the Kerner Commission report, the Walker report, Dan Walker, in whose letter I have in my briefcase asking my help, is using the problem of patronage politics as his thrust in attacking both machines of both parties and saying it's high time we clean it up and get rid of it. How does it work? Well, I'll give you three or four examples, and I'll be quiet. The, uh, Number two man for the Department of Conservation is the assistant director. And you'd think that a man in the director of the department would pick his own people and then be fired or continued based upon the performance. It doesn't work that way. He also has a political job. It was kind of fun for me because I found that the governor's people had promised two men the same job to get their support in the campaign. I had to let one of them down easily. I felt a little like Miles Standish on that one. And uh, neither were qualified to be any better than dog catcher. This one man was in his 70s. He was senescent. He had a very bad work record. And uh, he thought he had a good political job. He came to see me, and I said, well, among the things I'd like to have you understand that we've changed since I took office, you will be at your desk working, not just on the duty, but you'll be there in work at 8.30 in the morning. You shall not leave before 5. You'll put in at least 60 hours a week of work, as I put in much more than that, and I expect you to help me set an example. We're going to change this deal around here and let people see what it's going to be like to give the taxpayer a dollar's worth of work for a dollar's of pay. You will not hunt and fish on company time, and that'll be quite a change. And although as a director, it's been traditional for me to have a limousine, my person in my position have a limousine and a chauffeur, I'd feel like the town clown. My Fiat works just dandy and it parks easier than those things and I drive myself. And you will too. <laughs> well, he decided he didn't want to work for me. <laughs> so he went back to the governor's office and they put him on as consultant in the highway department at $1,000 a month. He runs his insurance business and plays politics up in northern Illinois. And then the head man to be head of parks. He also been a county chairman and uh, very active in the campaign, so he'd always want to be the director of parks. Now, Illinois has the poorest parks of all the states in the Union, the least per capita land, the least management. You can't approach the privies downwind on a hot day. 
It's unthinkably bad, and it's a very poor portrayal of responsible government to a youngster who goes to a park, the only place he can enjoy the out of doors, and sees sloppy people doing a sloppy job, run down, say we haven't got the money, because they don't care. This man, who had a grade school education, who had never prepared a budget, had never had a single employee under him, this man who had a grade school education, who had never prepared a budget, had never had a single employee under him, was going to have this job because of the political reasons and the fact he'd camped quite a bit, which made him an expert. And I said, hell, I used a telephone for 40 years and I couldn't rewire it to save my soul. What's camping got to do with management, budgets, running people, set an example, the forestry problems and all the rest? Well, he still got the job over my bitter objections, but I was more obnoxious than he was because he left before I did. <laughs> the, he was a disaster, too, I might add. But how did they handle the problem? Well, he's got 1400 and some dollars a month in the car and expense account. He's back home playing politics. He's not off the taxpayer, he's just out of, was off my back in Springfield. And then they said to me, look, you can't worry about these, um, uh, the guys that cut the grass and run the trucks. We don't pay these people enough to get the high quality people. And why not, says I. Well, it's never been done that way. That's the way the county chairman keep their organization going. Both parties do it. Perfectly acceptable, as it isn't to me. Any organization worth a hoot has everybody in the organization on a merit basis. I don't care if it's race or politics or anything else. They work for the public. And please, when you're talking about civil rights, what is more nonsensical and repugnant than to say you cannot discriminate on any other cause, religion, race, anything else, but you can based upon the exercise of your sacred franchise as a voter? We want you to vote. We believe in it. You should register. But if you do and guess wrong, you're out of your job. That's discrimination in the worst form, isn't it? I think so. And we better clean up that and along with the others. And it's fun watching them squirm when I talk like that. Well, but uh, they finally agreed I, I could have a couple people of college degrees at the top, but why worry about those down below, below? And the very first week I was in office, they sent to me a county chairman, a man from the governor's office, and they wanted to get a job for a man that I had looked at the credentials on and thrown out. He was 83 years of age, but he had to be a truck driver in the state park. So I got them over. The explanation was interesting. He couldn't get a driver's license, but if he drove a state truck, nobody would stop him, so it would be all right. And I looked these people in the eye, and they thought I was an awful funny old fuddy dud. I took an oath of office to uphold the law instead of the governor, incidentally, and you have the guts to come to me and ask me to, to hire a man. And when I say this to youngsters in grade school and high, junior high school, it's kind of fun to watch their expressions, because mom says to them, you can't drive my car. We believe in the law. You would have a driver's license. And for your welfare, Sonny, you shouldn't drive it because you might hurt yourself or someone else or damage the car, and you're not old enough. And yet they'd say, give a driver's license, and there are a phony excuse like this, the double standards that are so evident, like the Hans Christian Andersen story of the child. You remember the emperor's clothes when he said, but mommy, he's naked. It's the same thing. The kids can see it, and we bloody well pretty soon if we expect to give the kind of job that needs to be done. Just one more example about the practicality of hiring good people and giving them leadership and doing a business-like job. This was under the previous administration, but it's equally possible under either party. It just didn't happen to be my bad luck. But a nice old man that had enough political clout to get a job cutting grass, and that's impressive, isn't it? But at least he was hired politically to cut grass in a park in Illinois. They brought him out to work one day about three years ago, maybe four, and they showed him how to start the lawn morning. He pulled the rope, he got it going, great. That's all he had to do. So he started to push the lawnmower, you know, the very first thing he did, he wasn't looking where he was going. He drove it into the heel of the assistant ranger, severed the tendon, the man collapsed. It's a very mean injury, incidentally. A family having a breakfast picnic in the park saw the accident and took the old gentleman, I mean the injured man, to the hospital. And the poor old guy, he was not an evil man, was so distraught, he had a heart attack, collapsed, and died right there but it cost the taxpayers of the state of Illinois for less than half an hour in job and maybe 10, 10 seconds of cutting grass over $16,000. And so we can go ahead and document these things on and on and on. And I submit to you that until we clean up the pollution in politics, we're not going to have a very effective way of cleaning up the pollution of the environment. But it can be done. In the community I live, three people were all that voted for the precinct committeeman. 
not a majority, but a total of three. There are hundreds of precincts in Illinois that have neither Democratic or Republican person there. You could serve in such a job perfectly well because as a member of the governor's cabinet, I can see the governor after waiting five and one half weeks for an emergency, and I got 15 minutes before I went to give a political talk. But a county chairman on a political level can go down to his office any day he likes and walk in without an appointment and not be hurried. So I'm submitting to you, in more detail later if you like, that the political opportunity, and you and I are in politics if we like it or not, because everything we do is governed by some statute, edict, decision. The question is, will it be good or bad politics? We get the government we deserve. If we leave it to the hacks and the ignorant and the indifferent and the selfish, we'll get that kind of government. And we've had it, and that's why we've got these problems as severe as they are. So don't write off the chance of participation in responsible, responsive government. We can with honor serve without any social problems. We can work for a hospital board or a school board or a park district. There's some things that nice people can do, the Red Cross, the Ladies' Aid, and all the rest. But it's a little bit dubious if you serve on a city council or run for the legislature. Now why? It's because we permitted this to happen. It's going to take a little more guts, a little sense of purpose, a little unselfishness, run for these jobs and scare the other kind out. Now winding up, I'm going to give you a pet story of mine, if I may, that Ray Mosdick, the head of the Audubon Society in Illinois and a very eminent man, a great man of accomplishment, uses to sum up his philosophies in trying to get the sense of humor because we've got to have some fun with it. We've got to laugh at ourselves or we can't see our mistakes. We can't win these people over if we're so deadly serious and we're nothing but dull bores. We've got to be able to laugh and weave with it, find the answer, find the way to his heart even as a pocketbook and show him how we can do it better and more sensibly. It's the compassion, the understanding, the sense, the resourcefulness. It's summed up in his little story about the American tourist in England. This American had been visiting parks and museums or something like that all day long, and he was really bushed. He was tired and hot and just worn out. He went to the depot and the train was quite late, and he finally got aboard, and it was slow and hot and crowded and jerky, and he couldn't find a place to sit down. It was full of people. And as he walked through the train, car to car, compartment to compartment, he couldn't find a place to sit. And he saw in one compartment, finally, one seat not occupied by a person, but by a Pekingese dog. So he went in the compartment and said to the woman next to him, would you please put your dog on your lap or on the floor? I'd like to sit down. And she looked up rudely and said, I would not. She certainly would not. She'd paid for the seat and the dog would stay there. Well, he was a little startled by the rudeness and all the rest. He leaned back and he was tired and more angry and more frustrated and quite uh, taken aback. And the conductor came forward and he said, would you, the American said, would you please take care of my problem and get me that seat. The conductor spoke to the woman, got the same rude answer. He shrugged his shoulders, went about his affairs. The American standing there, leaning up against her in the Donald train, jerking along, hot, tired, and frustrated. And all of a sudden, he didn't quite know why, but impulsively, he reached over and picked up the Pekingese dog and threw it right out the window. <laughs> and the old Englishman who had been sitting there watching this whole performance looked up and said, you know, he said, you damn Yanks do everything backwards. You come to England and you drive on the wrong side of the road and you pick up your fork with the wrong hand, and now you've just thrown out the wrong bitch. <laughs> in our effort, in our efforts that will be great, they will also be rewarding. There is no other choice, no other alternative. But let's use the talents and the tools constructively, realistically, and fairly, and if we do, then maybe our children can still be proud of us. Thank you. Thank you.